our chat. There's quite a few of you this evening. I think we've almost have a, we're gonna get started in just a minute. I'm just letting a few more students in. Ooh, that looks good. You can turn off the oven then too, sweetheart. So just a reminder to make sure everyone has their mutes off on. Mm -hmm. But I think that's everybody. I'm gonna to try to keep an eye on that as well. So welcome uh, to everybody this evening to our faculty panel here, the Honors College at the College of Charleston. My name is Dr. Mar Bernstein and I'm the Dean of the Honors College. And I want to first start off, start off by congratulating you on being accepted to the College of Charleston and to the um, Honors College. So I'm having to do double duty here. So I'm admitting people as I welcome you. <laughs> um, as a student in the Honors College, um, you're gonna be part of a smaller community within the College of Charleston and that has recently established itself as one of the top 40 public Honors Colleges in the nation. So congratulations. We've done a comprehensive review of your application materials and we're confident you will be a great fit for our program. Here at the Honors College, we really pride ourselves on community opportunity and innovation. And as a freshman in the Honors College, you'll be assigned an Honors Faculty Advisor, many of whom are with us here this evening, who'll work with you for four years as you navigate the curriculum, identify opportunities for experiential learning, such as internships, research, and study abroad. But they're also mentor you as you prepare for post-graduation life, however you see your success. So whether that be landing your first um, dream job at a place like JP Morgan, heading off to pursue a PhD at a place like Harvard, starting your own business, or embarking on a year abroad as a Fulbright Fellow, we are here to support you and the possibilities for your success are endless. In addition to your honors faculty advisor, each honors freshman will also be assigned a career coach from our nationally recognized career center. And this added resource will assist you in, hold on, I'm admitting people, I can't talk and do this at the same time, <laughs> um, will assist you in, um, identifying opportunities to help you um, be successful in your post-graduation career by developing your professional portfolio so that you can be one step ahead of that competition. Uh, so in the fall of your freshman year here at the Honors College, we have a very unique experience for you. And fortunate, we have two of the faculty that run the Honors College first year experience um, with us here this evening. And so there's an honors course that you'll take that's designed to engage you with a community um, a very uniquely Charleston specific course. And this course is gonna be paired with an honors engaged experience, which is a year long community engagement uh, requirement where you're gonna be immersed in the community to address the critical issues in our community, such as housing and security um, and, and equities and, and healthcare access, for example. And so again, um, the faculty that we have here tonight on this panel will be able to answer questions about that very unique experience. So as you continue your education, the Honors College will be afforded the benefits of very small, unique courses that are filled with 100% of honors students and are often interdisciplinary. You'll have easy access to world-renowned faculty, myriad of opportunities that you're encouraged to engage with as early as your first semester, so your first year, I'm sorry. So far, far earlier than some of your peers at larger institutions. And so tonight I've got, um, many of the great faculty who teach in the Honors College joining me. And so they're here to answer some questions. Um, and so I'm gonna let them introduce themselves and then we'll go ahead and start the panel. I will want to encourage you that although I do have some questions that we'll start off with, I wanna encourage you to add any other questions in the chat room and then I'll address them either as we go along or at the end of the faculty panel. So um, Dr. Ganaway. Yeah. Would you like to go ahead and start off? Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Brian Ganaway. I'm the Interim Associate Dean of the Honors College and the Director of the International Scholars Program, and I'm a member of the faculty in the International Studies Program. Dr. Permitter? 
Hi, I'm Dr. Permenter. I'm an alum of the Honors College at College of Charleston, so I know all the inside stuff from way back when, but now I'm a faculty fellow and director of student engagement, which means that I, with Dr. Cavalli, run the first year experience and then get to teach a bunch of other fun courses in the department. Dr. Collins Froelich? I am Dr. Collins Froelich. I am an honors faculty fellow. I teach a lot of honors introduction to academic writing. So many of you might have the opportunity to take a class with me your freshman year. Um, in addition to the work I do as an honors faculty fellow, I also am the director of the Office of Nationally Competitive Awards. So you would come to work with me to find interesting study abroad opportunities that involve scholarship and eventually hopefully apply for a Fulbright, Marshall, Mitchell, Rhodes, or any of our other prestigious scholarships. Thank you, Professor Afonso. Good evening. Uh, I'm Lancia Afonso, and I'm a faculty of uh, Honors Faculty Fellow, and uh, like Dr. Permenter, I'm a graduate of the College of Charleston Honors uh, Program. Uh, I serve as the director of uh, the Honors uh, Entrepreneurship Living Learning Community, and I teach in the departments of Computer Science and uh, the School of Business, Marketing and Management. And Dr. Cavalli. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Jennifer Cavalli and I'm the Assistant Director of Student Engagement for Honors. I'm also a faculty fellow and I do advising and teach a, a number of colloquium courses uh, as well as advanced studies. And I work closely with Dr. Permenter in the Honors First Year Experience and direct Honors Engaged. Great, thank you. So our first question is gonna be for Dr. Ganaway and he can start off and then I'd encourage the other faculty to go ahead and, and chime in afterwards. So um, Dr. Ganaway, how would you describe the role that you play as an honors faculty advisor and mentor? So this I suppose is one of the most interesting parts about the honors college is it is an undergraduate focused institution. So faculty in terms of tenure and promotion are heavily invested in that. So if I take these one at a time, let me start with the advising component. So when you come to the College of Charleston in the Honors College, you are paired with a faculty advisor, the same faculty advisor for four years, regardless of your major. So you have continuity in a relationship with them. Now, on the one hand, that person is helping you pick the proper classes. This is important. But more significantly, they are mentoring you on long-term goals. And this is sort of silly, but I joke with the students and I say, when I look at them, I don't see an 18-year-old, I see a 28-year-old. So in other words, I'm asking them, where do you want to be 10 years from now? And they say, I want to be an X. And then that codes me to say, okay, I need to think about internships or study abroad or research experiences, or nationally competitive awards. So we are sort of trying to holistically develop uh, these young people into high performing adults in our society. Now, I actually spend a lot of time advising, but I am at heart an egghead. I do really like being a professor. So I very much enjoy being in the classroom. And what honors affords me is I'm in classes that I run by myself that have 15 to 17 students, where I can have a very rigorous discussion, reading, and writing components. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as high impact learning strategies. There's really good evidence that these provide the best outcomes. So I know my students. I actually know them in the first week because there's just not many of them, but even an old guy might, like me can memorize that many names. Uh, but it is an intimate learning experience. Uh, we've had a lot of success with it. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add to that? I'll go ahead and, and add to it. And um, so as an undergraduate in the Honors uh, College way back, uh, I'm not even going to mention when, the intimate uh, experience that Professor Ganaway uh, mentions over here where your faculty member not only knows you by name, uh, but know your plans, uh, not only your current plans, but uh, with the pace navigator and the advising that we have uh, actually actively helps steer you. So we, not only your faculty members, but we also mentors. 
and uh, we surround you with other peer mentors. And so the powerful part about the Honors College is that you're, that you're with like-minded individuals. And so to me as a faculty member, that's really uh, engaging. Uh, I'm engaged by my students, with my students, and we're on this collective learning experience together. And so uh, that's what I really enjoy as a faculty advisor and mentor in the Honors Program. And I would just add, speaking for the first year experience part, that what Dr. Ganaway said about a continuity and advising being really important, in addition to the one advisor that you're assigned, because we start our first year by asking you to work on a resume and a personal statement and a four-year plan, there's a very good chance that Dr. Cavalli and I have seen those documents in your very first semester. And so we have the opportunity to really get to know students from the very beginning. We have a, a high interest usually in students participating in those programs after their first year and kind of working in student leadership positions. So we get the, the kind of double benefit of working with you on multiple levels if you decide you want to remain engaged in that part of the community. Great, thank you. Um, how does the Honors College support students in finding internships, research, study away, and or job opportunities? Dr. Collins Froelich, you want to start us off with this one? Sure. So one of the great resources of many that you have at the College of Charleston and the Honors College is that you get access to a lot of folks who know where to point you to find the things that you want to find. As Dr. Myers Bernstein um, told you, we have a recognized career center on campus and you will have a mentor kind of assigned for that, an advisor. Um, other places that we work to really help you find um, internships, study abroad opportunities, language learning opportunities throughout your undergraduate career is actually in the Office of Nationally Competitive Awards. So much in the same way that Dr. Ganaway starts advising sessions by asking you who you want to be when you're 28 or thinking about you as a 28 year old, um, the Office of Nationally Competitive Awards offers you an opportunity to think in that direction as well. And so we do a lot of work with students beginning even in their first semester freshman year to think about those awards and goals that they have for their time at the College of Charleston and to think through maybe there's languages you would like to learn that um, are not offered on campus, there's places you would like to study, um, courses or internships you would like to take abroad that are maybe um, beyond the scope of what is offered at CFC directly or through faculty affiliate programs and we can help you find awards and ways to get there. Um, we also have a really great system of faculty affiliate programs um, and st the study abroad office can do a great job of helping you find ways to take um, skills that you're learning here on campus and enhance them or apply them in new environments, uh, foreign or domestic. And so there's a great framework here between your mentors and advisors that you get in the Honors College, the Office of Nationally Competitive Awards, and um, the Center for International uh, Education that can help you find those opportunities that you would like to have. Thanks, anyone else wanna chime in? So I can talk a little bit about this. So um, we do have some opportunities that are specific for the Honors College. So for instance, um, we as faculty um, get to know our students very well as which we've, we've talked about already. And so we use that information to try to identify new opportunities, reach out to the community, um, partner with other institutions, for instance, the Medical University of South Carolina down the street and try to really um, set up our students for opportunities and give them easy access to those opportunities. And so one of the ways we do this is we have a website um, called the Honors Hub. And I'm gonna go ahead and post that link in the chat for you. And the Honors Hub actually is a, is a, um, a website that gives you as a student um, a lot of information at your fingertips. So you'll find forms on how to sign up for advising. You'll find what classes are gonna be taught that next year. And I encourage you to look through all of that material, but it's also where we post a lot of opportunities for our students. So for instance, if we have, you know, 
a, a colleague or someone we know in the community who is looking for honor students for an internship, for example, um, we send them to the hub and they can go ahead and set up a post and then you as students have access to that 24 seven and you'll actually get a weekly update on new things that have been added to the, to the um, hub. So there may be upcoming um, internships, maybe there's gonna be some deadlines for some nationally competitive awards. You'll see on there some opportunities to um, go to a talk and engage with faculty or network. And so it's a really great resource. And so all of our community partners are funneling those opportunities through there to the honor students. And so that gives you um, easy access to those as well, in addition to all the other resources that were just mentioned. Anyone else want to add to that? Yeah. Oh, Professor Fonso? Yeah, I think I'll chime in. I'll maybe answer TJ's question in the chat about uh, notable uh, internships. And so uh, one of our students recently, in fact, this week, just received a, a Department of Energy uh, internship uh, uh, last year. Uh, I'm looking at it more from the computer science and cybersecurity. Uh, a student intern uh, with Langley as part of a smart scholarship. We have uh, uh, several students in, in federal agencies with internships as well as global internships. Uh, internally, we have our alumni who are with companies who often reach back to the honors college and give our students preference. In fact, become actively seeking for honors students. A great example are Booz Allen Hamilton, large technology company uh, that recruits for honors uh, students. Uh, Capgemini, one of the largest consulting companies based out of Paris, France, has hired uh, 16 of our graduates and, and actively looks uh, to offer internship opportunities. So again, it's a combination. We, we, we try to get to know you as an individual and then reach out to our networks as uh, Dr. Jethan Collins uh, Prolich mentioned. Uh, wonderful uh, career services, but it's alumni, faculty members, uh, and uh, in conjunction uh, with uh, the networks that we have, we have something called Handshake, where you can post and customize what you're looking for. And it not only looks at the College of Charleston network, but amongst global networks to look at uh, available internships. And this could be virtual or in-person, you know, given COVID uh, this year. Great, thanks for addressing that. We do have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so let's maybe go to those for a minute and then we'll go back to the other questions. A real quick one is that someone asked if it's being recorded and the answer is yes. And so, um, so that's an easy one. And, and Elizabeth Roberts, who unfortunately couldn't join us this evening because she was not feeling well, will communicate that with your student, um, I'm sure um, in the next few days. All right, so there's a question about academic flexibility. And a student says, what kind of academic flexibility is there? Like, would you be able to personalize an area of study you wish to explore if it isn't already offered? Someone like to address that? Yes, Dr. Ganaway? Hey, this is Professor Ganaway. So all students at the College of Charleston are required to have at least one major. Uh, so, for example, that's a catalog thing, and you have to do all the requirements in there. So that is not personalizable. However, many majors have tracks or concentrations that are personalizable. Uh, for example, I'm just going to give you the one that I know best, which is International Studies. It actually has five different tracks, and within those, <clears throat> there are a list of courses, and you would select the ones that you like. So there is flexibility within the majors. Now, we do not have, uh, some institutions have, for example, build your own majors. So if you were thinking of that, uh, we, we don't have things like that. Uh, but it is possible to combine more than one major. We've actually had some students that have three majors. We're sort of baffled at that, but they're very much go-getters. And you're also able to have minors. And the last example I wanna give, I haven't had a student do this for a couple of years, but this is interesting. Uh, friends, do you know that I've had students go to medical school who were music majors? And you're thinking, how is that possible? Well, they majored in music. They took six semesters of chemistry, calculus, two semesters of biology, and two semesters of physics, and got into Johns Hopkins. So <clears throat> the liberal arts and science model that we have does provide quite a bit of flexibility. All right, thank you, Professor Ganaway. I think that's a, a good answer. We do have, we're at a good size of an institution that we've got a diversity of offerings, 
but we're small enough and there's definitely an emphasis on interdisciplinary learning and um and the departments don't like to you know hang out in silos either and so there's always interdisciplinary programs that are being created between different schools across campus different departments and so there's a lot of creativity that goes into our curriculum and like professor ganaway said there's a lot of our students, especially in the Honors College, really kind of integrate different types of, of, of interest into very creative um, outcomes when they graduate. Okay, I had another question in here, which was about, um, yes, yeah, sports. So um, the student, uh, Chandler, so hello. Um, so she's committed to CFC for volleyball, was wondering how the Honors College handles a student athlete who has consistent practice and travels often. Who would like to address that? <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. You're getting the Professor Ganaway show. So one of my hats is director of advising. So I get most of the student athletes. So this is actually a really significant question because the athletes, their financial aid is tied up with being on the team. So we actually have a whole procedure for dealing with this. So when you come for the first time to sign up for classes in the summer, we have the practice schedules. And so we look at those and we block those out. We just say, okay, you can't take classes at those times. And we build your schedule around that. Now, that does work pretty well. Now, what it may mean is let's imagine you were coming here and you had two honors classes you wanted to take, one that you really wanted and one that you would take. And the one you really want is during practice. Well, we're not going to do that one. Um, we're going to take the other one. So sometimes you might have to compromise a little bit, uh, but we've had lots of student athletes and they've been very successful. Um, <clears throat> there's one I feel like I can't name, but he was a basketball player. Um, and then he transferred for his final year of eligibility to Florida, but he was studying nuclear physics. So he did an undergraduate degree in physics here by playing division one basketball and went to a graduate program at the University of Florida. And they went to the final four that year. Yeah, it's definitely doable. It does take a little bit of creativity, but we do um, work very closely with the advisors and athletics to make sure that you get what you need in both areas of interest, you know, the athletics as well as your academics. I'm a, um, trained as a neurobiologist. I have a lot of pre-med advisees and um, have had quite a few athletes that have gone off to medical school, graduated in four years and gone off to medical school. And so um, it's definitely doable. And even some of those really kind of um, high credit hour, um, really fast paced majors. So it's definitely um, something that we encourage our students to do if possible. All right. So, um, there's an, oh, actually, let me get back to our other questions and then we'll come back to the ones that are on the, on the chat in just a second. So, because I think that this is gonna tie in. Um, what is a typical honors class like and how are honors classes different from regular CFC classes? So Dr. Cavalli, do you wanna start us off with that one? Yes, I'd love to. Um, I mean, and I wanna pick up on a point, um, Dr. Nagarinstein, that, that you just raised about creativity. And I think that's the real heart of honors classes. Um, are, is the creativity that um, faculty bring to them because they're not only encouraged to do so, but are supported and have the, the freedom to do so. Um, Dr. Ganaway mentioned, and, and so did Professor Afonso earlier, that um, honors classes are smaller, and I, I think that's a primary characteristic. A typical honors class is smaller in size, and our course offerings in the honors core include discipline or like subject-based courses. Um, for instance, I'm a historian, I might teach a history class. That would be our foundations course because it's within that um, subject area. But we also offer a variety of interdisciplinary courses or seeing how subjects and approaches to study intersect with and shed light on one another. Um, and this is, this is one of the favorite types of courses for me to teach. Um, so for instance, um, these small interdisciplinary seminar style courses, um, so probably around 15 students is the average, um, focus on a central question. And the small size really allows me to create multiple options for assignments and research projects, which means 
I have flexibility to get to know you on a different level and help you realize the best mode to express your learning. Honors courses are often where I see students making deep learning connections among their classes, both honors classes and regular CFC classes. It's the intimacy, as Professor Afonso said, of the seminar style class that creates the space to reflect and synthesize um, the diversity and breadth of course content across campus. It's this space where students can reflect on what they're doing in their majors and minors and think about both in a new way, all while being supported by the thinking partners sitting around the table. Um, so the, for me, what's so special about honors classes is that it is a place where everyone's voice can be heard and what they're learning across campus in their non-honor CFC classes is not only honored, but explored further. Thanks, Dr. Cavalli. Anyone else wanna chime in on that? All right, I do have a couple questions about classes and kind of curriculum and AP credit. So let's go ahead and address those in the chat room. So um, Dr. Ganaway, I might, I might <laughs> lean on you a little bit um, just because you being all knowing director of honors advising. So a um, couple things. So how many honors classes would a student usually take every year? Um, it depends on the year. So in your first year, you're going to be taking the first year experience course, which is beyond George Street, um, academic writing course, and then one foundation course. Now, if you're, um, if you want to take the honors series of a science, then that it would actually be two semesters, it'd be two foundation courses. And then after that, you're taking one course each semester um, until you get to your late junior, senior year, then you're actually focusing on what we call the um, a, a direct, what am I thinking of? Not the, the core, but the directed part of our curriculum where you're actually doing uh, mentored research. So the first couple of years you're doing one a semester. Um, and then not all your classes are honors, that is correct. That's what Courtney had asked, there is a mix. And so you take um, about a quarter of your coursework mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. honors, maybe a little less mm -hmm. than that in honors. And then the rest of your classes you're taking in the general curriculum. So it's nice because you have your honors courses that are just honors students. And then you have your general curriculum courses, which are gonna be a mix. There's obviously gonna be some honors students potentially in there, but also a lot of non honor students as well. And so you have a chance to interact with and you know, all communities um, on our campus. And uh, Dr. Ganaway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to address this one because I think this gets a, is a very nuanced question and has to do with how your AP credit applies um, in regards to honors classes. Yeah, so uh, friends, first of all, the College of Charleston does indeed accept AP credits, IB credits, dual enrollment credits, and CLEP credits. So I want to put your mind at ease for that right now. Um, there is no hard and fast rule about how we cancel students to accept or reject these transfer credits. I'm just going to give you two very simple examples. Let us imagine that your child wants to come here and major in chemistry. Uh, they worked very hard and passed the AP chemistry exam. We're going to advise them to waive those credits and take those classes here because that is in their core area. If that same student got a five on the AP European history exam, she can have all of those credits. It would be reversed if someone was majoring in history. They would keep the AP chemistry credits but waive the AP European history credits. Now, the big question, the sensitive part that Professor Meyer Bernstein brought up, <clears throat> what about honors classes? You generally cannot use AP, IB, CLEP or transfer students to remove honors requirements. You must, for example, do your first year experience here. You cannot use transfer credits to complete an honors requirements within the curriculum, such as a foundations class, a colloquium class, or an advanced class. The one exception to this 
is an overlap between the campus-wide math requirement and the honors quantitative requirement. Students who AP out of calculus, so have taken AP Calc AB or AP Calc BC, may count that for that requirement because that doesn't count towards the 25 hours of HONS credits. So uh, if I can tie that together in 10 seconds, yes, you can use lots of AB and IB credits here, but not to replace honors requirements. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Ganaway. Um, did anyone wanna add anything to the other answers I gave with regards to the classes? No, okay. Um, all right, so, oh, follow up. Can you use English AP credit? Um, not to get out of the honors academic writing course, but it will count as elective credit at the college. So the college will take it. It's just you still have to do the academic writing, um, honors version of academic writing. Our, um, our upper level courses, our interdisciplinary courses and our advanced studies courses are, are writing intensive. And so we just want to make sure that you have um, the right um, uh, instruction and the right, um, I guess, guidance as you move on to those upper courses by taking that honors uh, 110 course. And Dr. Um, Collins Froelich does teach that course often for us. Um, let's see, so question. Can you give an example of a research project you've done with a student in the field of math and or economics? Um, Professor Afonso, do you have an answer? Do you, have you worked with students in that realm? Otherwise, I can talk about an interdisciplinary project I worked on. So uh, I've worked with students in uh, computer science and economics, uh, uh, looking at um, uh, uh, data sets. And, and so I, I guess one of the more recent one was COVID and uh, how COVID uh, impacted uh, a, a small businesses uh, in, in different areas and, and, and and getting back and how businesses would have a, a crisis plan or contingency plan in place. So that had something to do uh, with economics, but uh, no, I have not worked with any math uh, students. So Dr. Myers Bernstein. So I actually um, did a really interesting project with a student. Um, so my background, as I said, is in neurobiology. And there was a student of mine who was, um, double majoring in biology and well actually I can't remember if he was minoring in econ or if he was double majoring in that but he was interested in neuroeconomics and um and so I actually co-mentored a project of his with the chair of the economics department at that time and he was doing this project where um he wanted to look at the effect of oxytocin which is what people call the love hormone, right? Um, and oxytocin actually increases in your body when you give other people hugs, okay? So he wanted to look at the effect of oxytocin on an individual's behavior on a particular game. So this was a video game, and I can't remember the name of it, I'm sorry, I'm not a gamer, um, a video game where the individuals had to choose whether or not to give a certain amount of money to one of the other players. And so the study was, if the hug was given before the person played the game, did that affect the outcome of the game or their behavior? And it actually did, and he subsequently got that published with um, Dr. Blackwell and the Department of um, Economics. So um, even as a neurobiologist, I got to work on a project with a student, um, but there's also a lot of um, work in, um, you know, students in mathematics doing research, and I'm gonna actually post this in the chat, a feature of one of our former students, John Cobb, who was an honor student. He won some nationally competitive awards. I think he was a Goldwater Scholar, is that correct? Dr. Collins Froelich um, also received, I believe, a Department of Defense award and is now um, doing his PhD in, um, in mathematics. So I'm just gonna post that um, there. And we do have a few of our honor students that are currently in the mathematics master's program, but I apologize that I have not personally been able to work with them on their projects. So let's see where we are in the chat here. Um, all right, so um, can you give some examples of graduate school acceptance success rates for the honor students? 
So I can give you some general numbers of those, um, of those rates. I haven't looked at them in the past few days, but our students are very, very successful um, at uh, getting into graduate school. So typically each year about, I would say 35% of our graduates apply to graduate school. Um, and, and the acceptance rates, at least of the last couple of years have been in the 90%. And so the data are a little bit variable because sometimes we actually survey the students before the end of the semester and they get acceptances after the end of the semester. Um, but our students are very successful into getting into graduate programs. And, and by graduate programs, I mean, master's, PhD, med school, dental school, um, MBA, all of kind of the, all, all of those um, collectively, law school, all of those programs. Um, and so um, they are very successful and get into very good programs. Uh, recently, we've had students that have started PhDs at Harvard, Vanderbilt, um, Emory, um, gotten full rides to medical school, obviously full rides to PhD programs if they're, if they're sciences and even in the humanities and social sciences as well. So a lot of success from our students. Um, Dr. Meyer Bernstein. Yes, ma'am. May I just add that Absolutely. you said about 35% apply and that's just the current graduating class. Oh yes, yes. If we look at one or two years out, we see a, even a much higher acceptance rate if someone's taking a gap year. So you don't have to go straight through if you wanna take that experiential year or two in between. That's a really great point. A lot of students are taking gap years before they go to um, graduate schools or medical school, um, probably more so than they did in the past. Um, so that's a, that's a really good point. All right, so, um, okay, here we are. All right, question four. So what makes CFC honors distinct in setting students up for success? And I know we've talked a little bit about this already, but I'm gonna let Professor Afonso talk a little bit more. I would say it's a, it's a combination of factors, uh, including the individual attention, but um, our curriculum has a lot uh, to do with setting students up for success. Uh, it is both interdisciplinary, highly personalized, uh, research oriented. Uh, you have a significant academic writing component, a collaboration component. And so uh, in a nutshell, we really prepare our students to solve the problems of the 21st century, you know, uh, in terms of systems thinking, looking at, at things holistically, but being able, able to actually deliver. And so in addition to the curriculum, beginning with your freshman year in BGS, uh, you have, are surrounded by some terrific mentors, peer mentors who've been there, who've made connections. And so in working with the peer facilitators and in BGS, you're, you come up with a pace navigator that helps you navigate your four years at the College of Charleston and beyond. And so I would say this level of support allows you to take advantage of opportunities in your freshman year. And so I posted something to the, to the blog over here where you know, students working with, with faculty members are able to do a lot more in their freshman year because they have terrific examples of sophomores and juniors who've gone uh, before them who are able to share not only the experiences, but shortcuts and tips on how to better prepare for those experiences. So our students generally are a lot better prepared uh, than the campus in general, but it's that individualized, personalized attention to what your goals are that allow us to help you tell whatever your compelling story is. Thanks, Professor Afonso. Does anyone else want to chime in on that? I'll chime in on that just a bit because I get to work with students in national awards throughout their entire career. And one of the things that I've noticed by the time our students in the Honors College graduate, they've had a lot more opportunities for leadership and to become mentors themselves. They've had a lot of experiences, maybe even being a student teaching assistant in a language course or a lot of hands-on learning connections to communities that have allowed them to build a really um, diverse portfolio of skills and experiences. And I think that's really what makes our students stand out in things like national awards applications. But I also think it's a great asset to take into your graduate school application 
applications. I work with a lot of students, even after they've graduated in their gap year, they'll reach out again and say, hey, can you help me with, with these statements and these kinds of things? And one of the things that graduate schools really like to see about our students is that they have had these experiences and these opportunities to be leaders and thinkers for the whole community, whether that's on campus or off campus in the greater Charleston area. Thank you, Dr. Collins Froelich. Dr. Kavali, did you want to chime in? Yeah, a few of those sentiments, if I could. And, and I think, um, you know, what Dr. Collins Froelich mentioned about um, what really makes Canada stand out in their personal statements when they go on to other opportunities um, is, is the focus in the Honors College of um, taking theory and putting it into practice getting out of the classroom and applying your learning. Um, that's certainly something that we like to do in the Honors Colleges, create leadership opportunities. But we also start that right in the beginning of your college career through our internal um, honors first year experience. Um, that is a large part of our program. And in fact, we do um, ask you to commit to a year long um, civic engagement project. And sometimes that's through being on site and working directly with a community partner. And sometimes that's working in smaller discussion groups with a liaison to tackle critical issues effect affecting um, the Charleston community as a whole. And so that awareness, creating that awareness, embedding that in, in the way that you move through the rest of your college career is certainly our goal. And we've seen a lot of success with that. So we've had students who left Honors Engaged who went on to say, no, we really want to keep talking about this. We really want to keep hosting events and attending events and bringing that learning back um, to one another and then to the larger community. And so they developed their own student association, which we supervise now through um, Honors, the Honors College, so we can give them the support that they need. Thanks, Professor Cavalli. So we actually have a, a parent um, on the Zoom tonight who is a parent of a current student, actually one of my advisees, Faith Amatu, and one of our recent graduates, Sophia Amatu, and she wanted to um, give her perspective on, on this question. So Ms. Amatu, are you there? Yes, Dr. Maya Barson and everyone, good evening. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Good evening. Yes, I am so excited. Listen, I just wanted to share our experience. It's been a blessing being a C of C, of course. Uh, we started out with Dr. Foles Bennett and then moved over to the new um, um, president of the college, Honors College. It was indeed, it, it's been a blessing having the girls there. Um, Sophia, of course, uh, needed a lot of uh, guidance because she was our first one. And she is doing so well at MUSC as a second year medical student. That has really helped her. The research was great. Um, the team guided her very well. Um, she didn't, she was very, very, very guided. And, and that made her journey, not that it's easy, of course, but the help she got from the Honors College really helped her journey into med school. And Faith, of course, as a junior, she is also, um, she wants to go to dental school. And so she's been really, really uh, working hard. There's a lot of uh, resources. Even uh, recently, she just let her, uh, told us um, she's having, doing research this summer while she's preparing for her dad exam. So um, a lot of help from the Honors College. So we really do, um, we're so proud of our, our, our CLC. And uh, we're looking forward to, um, well, the third, the baby girl want to come too. I said, okay, that I am so, we're looking forward to um, just getting everybody, being an alumni family, and we'll continue to support, you know, the best we can. So I tell y'all, come on, everybody, come on, CLC, Honors College, that's the way to go. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. And you keep sending those wonderful kids our way. 
you. That's the girls. I'm done with the girls. I got two boys left. I don't know where we'll take them. If they're anything like their sisters, we'll take them too. You take the boys too. Even okay. if they're not, even if they're not, we'll take them too. So okay. Thank you. I appreciate I appreciate your offering that perspective. So now there was a question Chisholm asked if someone desires to do uh three is it a four year? She was thinking about doing a three-year program. She's something else when it comes to all of that. I said, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we have um, we have our fair number of students that that graduate in three years. Um, um, I'd, I'd say probably about five each year, Dr. Ganaway. Would you say that's a good estimate? And they go on. My, you know, one of mine went on to um, in three years. He got a 4.0, did two research projects, and went off to to medical school after three years. So, but Dr. Ganaway, did you want to chime in on that too? Uh, yes, uh, yes. So, so we do have students, and we work with them. And it's much easier to graduate in three years if you're bringing in between 25 and 30 transfer credits. So that's more typical for that. Um, finishing in six semesters is challenging. And so we just like to suggest uh, you want to think of very compelling reasons to do that. Uh, so you don't want to do it just to do it. Uh, if you've earned eight semesters of college, this is a remarkable moment in your life. We encourage you to take those eight semesters. Thank you. Muted. Thank you. Um, all right, so where were we on our, actually, let me get to those couple, these couple student questions because I want to make sure that we address um, the students' questions. So one was um, if they wanted to use our stats AP credit, would you have to do more math, even if it's not required for the major? And the answer would be yes, because there's a general education math requirement at the college that requires at least two semesters or through calculus. Um, in order to complete the general ed requirement. So you would have to do, um, do more math. And then another question, again, this has to do with AP, um, is uh, how do you apply that as a specific form? And so, there's a, and, and so there's not, so they come in. And so there's all these questions about AP credit and IB credit and what you're bringing in. Um, we will be working carefully with each one of you over the summer during orientation to evaluate your AP credit and to see what makes the best sense for you given your, your, um, your goals, okay? So as Dr. Ganaway mentioned before, sometimes um, we'll ask you to waive it if it makes sense. Um, we'll let, certainly encourage you to keep it if that makes sense as well. And so um, there's no particular, there's no form that comes through. So those, those scores get sent to us. Um, I know that some of them won't come in until after orientation, but we'll work with you during that um, orientation when we register for you for classes to make sure that we get you in the classes that we that um, we together collectively believe that that um, would be the best fit for you for the fall. And then once you get those AP scores in later in the summer, Dr. Ganaway, he will email you and be like, congratulations, you just got a five on your calculus, you know, BC AP exam. And, um, and so, you know, now you don't have to take calculus or so let's figure out kind of what the, the alternative course would be. So, um, all of the, what we do is we work with each student individually on this. So there is a, um, a website, it's the Tran Transfer Resource Center, and I'll put that link up here in a second. And that's gonna have kind of general information on um, AP courses, but, but we work with students individually. And Dr. Cavalli, yes. Dr. Meyer Bernstein, I just wanted to mention, I've already put that resource into the chat. Perfect. It, it should appear. Okay, awesome. Okay, I do not see it. Did I, oh, no, you know why? Because I didn't scroll down. Okay, absolutely. So, all right, so thank you. So yes, go ahead and look at that and that'll kind of give you the general framework of what we do at the college. But again, just we will work with each student individually because it's really on a, a case by case basis that we that these decisions are made. All right, so um, uh, let's see, what's the total number of honor students that have been admitted this fall? I don't know the exact number, but what we're shooting for is a class of about 275. We have about 750 students currently in the Honors College right now. Um, what differentiates CFC Honors from other Honors Colleges? Um, 
Would someone else like to address this? Just so I'm not doing the only one talking, Dr. Ganaway. <laughs> so, and I always have to be careful with this because I don't want to answer this question in a way that says those guys stink. Um, that's not helpful. Uh, but so what I want to say is Charleston is this funky place. It's not huge, uh, but it's important in terms of global commerce. It's got a lot of tradition and it's got state of the art software companies and business school and hotels and tourism. It's in what was a very traditional Southern state that's changing in all kinds of ways. It's got energy. There's things that are being built here. And so I know that may seem a bit amorphous. That's what's different about us is we're looking to kind of solve problems going through into the future. So we have to deal with climate change. We're on the front lines. The social issue facing our country is right here. Uh, we are engaging with those, trying to prepare students to contribute to a uh, society and democracy. And as Professor Afonso and Professor Collins Froelich said, we're not preparing your student for 2022. We're preparing them for 2052. So we're talking about the problems that I don't even know what they are. So, so I can't talk about those problems. What I have to do is give them method, scientific method, humanities methods, social science methods, arts methods. So if I was going to try to make the case, why do you want to send that child here? Because we're looking not only to cultivate them so that they can have a career, but how to figure out how they can um, participate in our society and make things better for all of us. Can I add to that also, Dr. Meyer Bernstein? So I think one of the other things that, that kind of goes hand in hand with that, that makes us distinctive is a lot of honors colleges, um, th they operate their curricula a little bit differently in terms of what you're required to take and the different options. With CFC honors, we provide this immediate cohort experience that gives you the support that you need to develop those skills that Dr. Ganaway was talking about. And then when you get to your upper level classes, you already have this familiarity with each other. And it's, I like to think of it as sort of a meeting of the minds where all these different majors come together and contribute to a discussion about those problems. And it just keeps that interdisciplinary nature really at the forefront of what you're doing because you've had that strong cohort experience from the beginning. So uh, some other schools do offer that, but many don't. They just say you take a certain number of honors courses and you check the box and you're good with that. I think that because we have kind of a built-in set of requirements um, and a scaffold for you to follow, it operates a little bit differently. Yeah, I agree with that. And one of the things that um, I hear from so many students is the community. Um, the community is, and I think that that goes, you know, hand in hand with what you, with Dr. Permanent and Dr. Ganaway were saying is, is you form that community on day one um, and the, the students um, really enjoy each other's company. So there's a great community amongst our students. We foster that community by building in peer mentorship. And so it's beyond your year, but it's your, your have a community with other students of other ages that can help mentor you. I think that was a cat, Dr. Ganaway, <laughs> mentor you through your four years. There's a community of faculty and advisors. So in, in some institutions, um, the advisors aren't faculty, they're staff members, but here all of our faculty advisors are teaching in honors and working with honors students and we're academics and we're scholars and that community not only supports the students, but so that we support each other. And so um, it's a very uplifting community for, for everyone. And of course the, the Charleston community as well. Our first year experience, you're gonna be involved in that community right away. And so you have this wonderful support system that um, it's, it's not um, overly competitive. Students support each other and they see that, there's, that someone else's success doesn't get in the way of their success, but it lifts up the entire community. And so there's um, that that is highly valued amongst the faculty, but also amongst the students. And I hear it over and over again, how different the community is here compared to other institutions. 
Um, we've also talked about a few things um, with regarding opportunities. And I think this is something that's a, a bit unique at the College of Charleston generally, because we have so many wonderful resources, but we are a, a institution that's focused on the undergraduate. And so all those opportunities, all those resources are targeted at you and made available to you as an undergraduate student. And so you may not get one lab experience or you may not go abroad once, but you may have three or four or five of these experiences because you can start engaging those experiences earlier on um, than perhaps some of your peers. And so that allows you to be really um, ready to go out and you know, said, get those jobs, get into graduate schools um, after graduation, be more prepared for those competitive opportunities. And then in honors, we, like I told you before, we tee you up for those. And so we know you so well that if someone says to me, oh, I have this great opportunity and I can say, I know exactly who that'd be perfect for. And so that is, that is um, just to your advantage as well. And so that makes it a very unique experience for students. All right, so there's a couple other questions here. Um, how is the number of admitted students this fall compared to previous years? Do you expect to have the same number of freshman honors you did in previous years? So I don't know what the number of admitted students is right now. Um, we expect to have the class a little bit bigger this year, um, about 275. Traditionally, in the last few years, we've had about 265. This year, we intentionally were a little bit smaller. Um, so we're thinking about 275. So that's a about on par how we've been for the last the last few years. Um, there are a few questions about scholarships here. So about with regards to the second year, and I just don't have those data. I know that there's certainly honor scholarships, but as well as departmental and school scholarships that are available for current students. And so we have a, um, a program that it's a database really that students kind of set up a profile in, and then any, any opportunity that they're eligible for, any scholarship will become available. And those that usually happens in about February of each academic year. So um, you'll have easy access to the list of those types of opportunities. And again, they're offered all over campus. Um, and I think we've got all of the questions here on the chat. And we did not get to all of our questions that we um, were going to discuss, but we are just about out of time. So um, if anyone has one last question that they wanna throw into the chat room before we leave, uh, we'd be happy to answer that. And right now I'm not getting anything. So I guess we answered everybody's questions. So, um, I just want to say thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Thank you to the faculty panel um, for answering all the questions and providing all your, your insight. And, um, and I hope to see the students here during orientation and on campus this fall. And please feel free to um, reach out to us if you have any more questions. So thank you again and enjoy the rest of your evening.